click start. Yeah, so I will talk about Docker 1.12 and the build up to Docker 1.12 uh, um, as I, I see it. Um, and then afterwards I have a quick or not so quick demo uh, of Elasticsearch as a new Docker service. And this is where I, uh, I, I already talked about the agenda. So I will start first to iterate on what were the problems, in my opinion, for with Docker 1.9 or before Docker 1.9, so the operational problems that I encountered, and which were solved in the upcoming versions afterwards, like 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, but not in that much detail, we we'll see. And then I will, uh, I will go into a little overview about Docker 1.12, and the supposed new workflow as I see it, and at the end I will uh, give a, a, a little demonstration of Docker services and how they are composed and uh, what I did today, and I, I cross my fingers that the demo gets are with me, uh, that I create like Elasticsearch in a, as a Docker service and COPF, and we will, yeah, we, you guys will see hopefully, and I'm pretty confident that it will work. So, demo gods. So the early days of Docker 1.9, so I, I kicked out the slides about Docker and what it is because Docker Meetup, I don't think that I have to reiterate on it. So as we all know, group of processes controlled by C groups and uh, isolated by Docker namespaces. So that's a two sentence summary, and, um, but not that much tooling around it, right? So in, for instance, one of the big problems or the, the operation problems were that you can only forward ports in uh, Docker, before Docker 1.9. And if you want to discover, or you have a multi-host setup and you want to discover other containers on other hosts, then you have to know on which ports they were forwarded and then you have to somehow figure out how you can reach them. That was kind of a hard problem. Um, there were some nice tools around it. So Consul, for instance, and this tool called Registrator, who knows Registrator? Apple. Um, was helping out, so Registrator hooked into the Docker event stream, so if you do Docker events, then you get the stream of, um, of um, stuff that's going on inside Docker, and you have events like create or delete, or it was stopped on start, and um, Reg Registrator hooked into this event stream and then were able to uh, get out which ports were forwarded and which ports were used, which IP addresses were used, and this he put into console so that it were console services. Who knows console? Most of you. So uh, and this was kind of a nice um, workaround so you could just not care about what's inside the container but have an external service registrator who was hooking into the uh, Docker server and then was fetching the information needed, puts it in console and then everyone was able to uh, discover new services. Um, and, but this implies that you, uh, it was not implying, but most of the time I used hard map ports, like I had Elasticsearch on 9200, and I mapped it outside of OSO as 9200, and if you have this set up, then you cannot run multiple services of the same kind on the same host, right, because this host, this exports ports were already used. So that was kind of ugly. Registrator would have helped because uh, it would, even if you just use a random port for forwarding to the outside, then Registrator would, would uh, catch this, but it was still ugly. So you had this port mapping and there were no multi-host networking. Another thing was that you had a nutted network, or you still have a nutted network in, in the default way, that you start a container and it will get an IP address from this uh, hidden network that is within this Docker um, cluster, or within the Docker engine. And there was uh, one nice tool from uh, Jerome Pezzantoni, which, called, which was called Pipework. Someone used Pipework, which is basically just a shell script, but just is like, it's, like more, it's not just a uh, shell script. Uh, it was uh, a shell script that creates uh, a network bridge and then attached this network bridge to a Docker container, which was, uh, and it was really an interesting shell script. And it was easy to create a new network interface within the container. So you could uh, launch a container without any networking. So you only have loopback device within the container. And then you use Pipework to create a new HT, uh, ETH0 interface within the container with the IP address that you uh, yeah, come up with. And then you could externally address this container because you used an IP address that everyone can, can address, right? So that was kind of nice. It was like the bridge network uh, on multiple hosts um, due to this pipework container. And yeah, and, and this was also 
there was another interesting tool, and I forgot the name, I think I, I forgot the project name, um, which was basically the same or kind of a, like registrator where it hooked into the Docker event stream and then were reacting on creation events of containers and then you could present a, a command that has to be executed. So when a container comes up without internet, without network interfaces, then this little tool, and I forgot the name as I said, um, that, huh? OS3. The name? Yeah. Sorry, you're coming in? Power OS3. No, 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 it was something else. But it was basically, the container comes up and then script was executed with the ID, maybe it was, I don't know, with the ID and the, uh, and the, uh, the container name and all the information that you get from Docker events. And then it was using, or I was using pipe work to uh, create an interface like instantaneously. And this was, after one second you had this interface. So it was uh, kind of a nice thing. And then you have a lot of, you had a lot of, and you still have a lot of uh, third party tools like Weave or Rancher OS or what, all this jazz. They have like a professional pipe work and Docker events uh, set up on their own where you can pre-create um, network, uh, networks that span across multiple hosts and then use them um, yeah, within your containers. But for this, it's like not upstream Docker. In Weave's case, and I never used it much. Um, you do not use Docker, the Docker command line tool, but you use the Weave command line tool. It was just a wrapper around Docker, so that I never used much. So that was networking with Docker before 1.9. And uh, yeah, I will talk about volumes a little bit, but this was, I think, the main issue for me at least. And from 1.9 on, the life for me got a little bit easier. So in Docker 1.9, they introduced plugins, and uh, one was Docker networking, the other was Docker volumes. They introduced Docker Swarm, which was also <laughs> nice. So the stable version of Docker Swarm, the um, unstable version was, uh, was even before Docker 1.9. And they introduced user namespaces, which is a cool security feature, or supposed to be cool security feature that I don't use, because I'm not a security guy, as <laughs> you maybe. Uh, but yeah, I work on my laptop, so don't worry. Um, yeah, Docker networking in the 1.9 introduced multi-host networks. Um, which creates a network that spans across multiple uh, nodes. Although before, as I said, you have a nutted network on each Docker engine, or Docker, it was not Docker, called Docker engine by this time, but each Docker daemon, and it was not addressable from, from other hosts. But with Docker networking, you could span a network that spans across multiple hosts. And this was called overlay. And we see one here. Yeah, overlay. And, um, and when you uh, create a container and tell him to use this overlaid network, then it doesn't matter if it's on the host one or on host two, you can reach, the container can talk to each other no matter on which host they reside, which was uh, kind of nice because it's very transparent to the user. So if the, if the user is trained to use only one laptop and then he stumble upon the multi-host uh, Docker environment, he actually don't, doesn't care much because he will just create an overlay network and then everything looks as if he would run it on his own laptop. And yeah, as I said, it was agnostic to where the uh, container resides, so you do not care. So in this do not care feature, I think is one that Docker uh, tries to emphasize a lot on. So this was kind of the, the developer has an easy life and it, it will work out of the box. Docker volumes um, is also a nice plugin that I haven't uh, exposed or explored so far. But um, normally if you run Docker, Docker run and you create a container, and you want to have one single pass in your, um, in your uh, Docker container that is not part of the overlay network. So for instance, you have a, a highly used uh, directory for your database or, a highly, or use Elasticsearch, then you do not want to have this Elasticsearch data, data deer inside of your overlay network because it will like, be, cause trouble and it will consume a lot of resources and it won't um, perform very much. So what you did or what, what Docker did back in the days was just use a normal POSIX path on the Docker host, map it into the, um, into the container, and then you had a normal X4 or whatever you, you have as an underlying file system, a normal POSIX directory within your container. And this was performing on somewhat the same speed as your host system, because it was just mapped into the container. Yeah, and with uh, Docker volumes, they have this normal local volume now, which is basically how it was back in the days. So you have like one local directory that is mapped into a POSIX path in your directory and uh, your container, and you can have other um, plugins that 
uses CephSS, that uses NFS, that uses different kinds of distributed data stores, hopefully, um, to uh, have a Docker cluster where you can, yeah, you, you can say, I don't care about a single host because if the single host goes down and you have a database on this single host, this volume where the data of the database resides can be mapped into another container on a different host. So this is basically what the problem that it solves, right? If you have a database, you don't want to be relying on one single host. And if you have a distributed uh, Docker volume that is mountable on any host, then uh, you are on the good side. So it was, uh, this is the Docker volume. And the Docker volume implementation is pretty easy, pretty nice, or pretty easy like it quotes. But uh, you just have to implement a couple of uh, crude uh, methods in, in, a, in a Go, a little Go binary that is able to create a volume on a, on a certain um, node and then uh, deletes it and updates it and so on and, and take the path back and then this is used by the Docker engine to determine where this um, volume is used. So it basically works that it will mount the path on the local Docker machine. So if it's NFS, then it will mount the path on your local machine and then map this local path uh, into the container. So this kind of thing, as I said, I haven't used it much, but I'm trying to use it a little bit more to have stateful containers that you can throw away and start somewhere else. Docker Swarm as well, a uh, very nice thing. So the problem is if you have multiple hosts and you want to spin up containers on multiple nodes, before Docker Swarm, you had to point your uh, command line interface, your Docker command line interface, to the host you want to start a container on, and then you can start the container. And I think, uh, I don't have uh, an example, but if you want to start one server or one container on server zero, then you point your Docker uh, client to Docker zero, start the container. If you want to start it on the second one, then you point it there and start the same container and so on. So that was kind of ugly if you have multiple nodes. What Docker Swarm did, uh, they created a Docker or they created a, a little Swarm client, which is also a container that hooks into the Docker engine, the underlying Docker engine, and then you have a Docker master that presents the same or kind of the same uh, API as the <coughs> Docker engine itself. And if you fire up a command, and it, it proxies basically in front of the Docker engine, if you fire up uh, a command and you tell him start a container, then he will start a container depending on the, on the setting you have, uh, maybe randomly on one of the nodes. But you could also um, alter this decision and say, okay, I have this constraint that I want to run on node <coughs> zero or server, server zero, for instance. And then the Docker Swarm Master will place the container uh, as you have, have um, told him to place it. So this was kind of a, that was very nice. It was very very easy to do, and uh, it worked quite well actually. And so moving on to Docker 1.10, they added a little bit uh, better storage. Um, the content is now addressable via images, which is also nice. So if you want to push or if you wanted to push an image in Docker 1.9 you didn't actually, or you had to figure out if the content that you want to push is already there, and this was one call that you had to do before. With uh, content addressable image IDs, you could just push this blob, because this blob was addressed by the content of the blob, and um, when the, the Docker registry said, okay, yeah, I have this content ID I already have, then you know, okay, I, I, I knew that you do not have to push it anymore, because this content is already there, right? So you had like, content slash ABC, and if you curl this ABC endpoint, and it will tell you, okay, it's already there, then you didn't have to push it. So it was very easy to, um, to reuse image IDs without all the fuss of getting first all the image IDs that are on the server and so on. So it was nice. And also, when you download content, one layer from the registry now, you can easily verify that the content that you downloaded uh, is, is legit because you could just hash it compare it with the image ID that you addressed and, um, and you, you know that it's all, all proper. They did some network improvement or network improvement in my case, they created an embedded DNS server so that you uh, can address other containers on your network by just using the name of the container or the ID of the container, which was uh, sounds nice, but in my case I use a lot of uh, console locally inside of the, of the Docker container and this Docker container wants to use the local host because the uh, console agent uh, exposes a DNS interface, so you had to tell the, uh, the, the Linux inside of the container to use the local host address. And with this embedded server, it runs on a different IP, on 127.0.0.11, 0 
So there is no local host to this embedded DNS server. So my setup with Consul was kind of blown. So that's why I stick to 1.9 for a long time, um, just because I couldn't use local host anymore. And I still cannot use local host. And I think I, yeah, I somehow said, OK, I have to deal with it. So I come, came up with other ways. But it was kind of a bummer in 1.10. Anyway. And Swarm got node failing handling. So if one Swarm node goes, goes berserk, then um, you could reschedule the container on different on another host. So that is just a little bullet point. Uh, Docker 1.11, which was February or April, I think, this year. Docker 1.9, by the way, was November last year. And Docker 1.10 was February or so. Uh, this was the first uh, runtime, the Docker engine, that was based on the um, open container initiative technology. So it's supposed to be um, reusable on other um, Docker or Anza Linux container engines. They introduced this runtime uh, C, so run C, runtime that is used under the hood. And it makes it now, or this made it uh, independent from one daemon. So before 1.10, you start a container, and it's a, it's a child of the Docker daemon, right? And if you want to restart the Docker daemon, then all the containers at least has to be stopped. And when you restart the daemon, you have to start them again. With this, in 1.11, um, the Docker daemon was not anymore the parent of the, of the container. So it was spawning the container with run C. And then you could. Uh, stop the docker daemon and your container will still run it and this is still the case so that was kind of uh, that was also a very nice feature so that you can <coughs> update your docker uh, engine for instance and do not care about the running containers because they are not going to die because of you updating the docker daemon. and they introduced docker load balancing where you have a container or maybe multiple containers with the same uh, type and then you can use this type name to uh, round robin across all containers. So you have like five Nginx running, and you query the IP address, and you query the, the type uh, Nginx, then the DNS, the embedded DNS will give you a round robin uh, across all this IP address, internal IP addresses of this, of this um, container. And they also added YubiKey signing. So uh, this is a little, and I have this uh, <laughs> at home, this is YubiKey is a little USB dongle. Um, which provides you um, with, with a key, with a private key, where you can sign images with. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it has a little security feature that you have to touch it when you create a new key, just uh, that you provide that you are there. Um, yeah, and they, they created this um, signing uh, strategy there. I haven't used it, as I said, I'm not a security guy, so I don't care about security yet. Um, <laughs> so, but I have this thing at home, and I never plug it in, actually. But, you can now, and this is where we go to 1.12 1 now. We still talk about 1.11. Um, this is where you now can um, tell the Docker engine that it's only allowed to run signed images, which is a cool security feature, and I think uh, I will start using it more. So that you have maybe a development, and a development team that says, OK, this is our official image. Someone, the boss, will sign it, and then the Docker engine um, will only run signed images. So you cannot go and say, okay, Docker pull Ubuntu and then uh, map something into my Ubuntu box. You can only run the signed images. So this is, for operation's sake, it's a very nice feature. And uh, like I said, I haven't used it that much. And if you have questions, so please interrupt me. And I will give you one opportunity while I'm drinking. No? And by the way, I will record it and put it in the comments to the Docker meetup. So we don't have to remember everything. Uh, yeah, so um, now we talk about SwarmKit. So I said before that with 1.9, they introduced Swarm, which was a, a container on its own. And within this container, they ran this SwarmKit application. And SwarmKit, as described before, just hooks into the local Docker engine and provides some advanced APIs uh, over the normal Docker engine. And um, yeah, with SwarmKit, you can you can download it or you can uh, get it from from GitHub from the Docker uh, repository, and you can create your own SwarmKit daemon and your own SwarmKit uh, control, so your own Swarm uh, client. And this, I think, is I haven't I have explored too much, but uh, in my opinion, this could be something that is very interesting for operations <coughs> because if you hide the API of the normal Docker Docker uh, engine, 
and only expose the SwarmKit API, then you are even not able anymore to run any Docker, and, uh, Docker container just by typing Docker run because you cannot start containers. You have to go through the SwarmKit um, to start containers. All right, so this is clear. So with, if you run a Docker engine and you expose the port of the Docker engine, then you can do Docker run Ubuntu and you will download the Ubuntu image and start it if you don't have any other security measures in place. But if you hide the Docker uh, endpoint in var run docker sock, then you have to be local to the Docker engine to start a container, so that's first. And so you are not able to remotely start containers. And what you do with SwarmD, you expose a different port, like maybe 2375, which uh, is this SwarmD port, and you cannot run this full Docker API on top of this. You have to start only services. So you can do Docker service create, Docker service list, and so on. But you cannot start single containers. And I think this is something that I really would like to look into more in the future, because I think that from operational standpoint, it kicks out a lot of uh, possible um, yeah, scenarios. If you, if you only have the, the, the means to run services on this swarm, on this cluster, then I think Docker uh, or the swarm kit might be a choice. But this is to be seen, and uh, I think with Docker Meetup, maybe we will talk about it in the future. So yeah, this is just uh, the example. So you run Docker Swarm D, and it will provide you with an endpoint. And then you can run this uh, Swarm Control command, which has the same um, options than the normal Docker command, but only the limited subset, right? So you can do local node ls, and you will see that you have one Docker Swarm uh, running on your local machine. OK. Now Docker 1.12. Woo! <laughs> Long story. So before um, Docker on Mac and Windows, as you all know, they, they use VirtualBox. And VirtualBox had the disadvantage that you have a distinct IP address for this uh, VirtualBox, right? So you were not able to use localhost in your exposed ports. And you had this VirtualBox lingering around, and this was uh, kind of uh, yeah, an ugly workaround. And when they introduced Docker for Mac on Windows, they said that <coughs> never have they seen a customer walking and say, ah, VirtualBox, so great. So they said, okay, maybe we should kick out VirtualBox. And what they use, they use a native operating and uh, the native virtualization for this uh, given operating system. In the Mac case, it's XHive. And as I re or as I understood it, it's, it stems from Beehive, which is a FreeBSD hypervisor that, uh, that is in FreeBSD. And for Windows, they use Hyper, no, they use Hyper-V. So there's one V too much, uh, anyway. And this thing uh, uses a local network of the uh, host. So they have three, three kits here, data kit, VPN kit, and hyper kit. And um, I don't want to go into much details. But uh, it's now very native to the operating system. So in Mac case, it it uh, hibernates when the system wants it to hibernate, and it, it uh, is much faster than the VirtualBox version because the system obviously has more control over it, and so on. So it's uh, much faster, and um, this localhost feature that you have a localhost network, so if you start an Nginx, you can type localhost into your browser, and you will get the result. So that's also nice. And Docker Engine got a lot of updates, uh, important ones. So now the first one is that uh, Swarm is now integrated into uh, the Docker Engine. So you do not have to start containers to run Swarm cluster. You just start the Docker Engine, and I will show it in the demo. Um, and then you can uh, create a Swarm cluster. All the traffic between the different Docker Engines is now TSL, uh, TLS encrypted. So also security, yay. Um, they introduced health checks. So you can have a container that uh, runs Nginx, for instance. And you have a health check within the container that determines if the service is yeah, present or not. So maybe you curl just uh, port 80. And if it gets uh, the return code 0, then everything is fine. And if it's not, then it's not fine. So that's like uh, Nagios or all the other health checks work. And this is now introduced as well. Uh, we got Docker services, and we will see this in a bit. And the Docker application bundle is an experimental feature in Docker 1.12. But this we will talk about. Uh, in a bit. So integrated swarm, and I will get skip to this slide because I will show it in a bit. Uh, health checks, they look like this. They have now this health check command for Docker files where you specify an interval which uh, says how often this health check should run. A retry, so if it's uh, one minute, 
uh, not responding with the proper error code, then this container will be marked as unhealthy. Uh, you have timeouts, so off, and you can imagine. And this command that you run is uh, specified there. So we have this uh, little shell script that I execute. And now we have a demo. Now we don't have a demo. I will have the demo at the end. Uh, yeah, services. But I will go. I, I will show this demo. Yada yada. And now um, with Docker application bundle, and you have uh, shown a little example of a Docker Compose file. The Docker Compose file has this disadvantage that it's not, or maybe some kind of an artifact, because you cannot really say that the image that you specified is the same image that you used one week ago. Or you can do it because you can uh, address it by a content hash, so you can do it. But normally you just use latest, or maybe you use developer, or so on. And this image can change, so the tag is not really not changeable, right? So you can change the tag, upload it to your Docker registry, and when you uh, the next time you, you start your Docker Compose file, um, you will get a different result. And um, with Docker Application Bundle, they use um, a Docker Compose file and somehow freeze the stack that is within this Docker Compose file. And I, I said, show it in the, in the demo. So this is basically what um, Docker Compose did to uh, Docker files so that you can um, create from Docker containers that you run, uh, now you create services. And I will, maybe it's better to show it than to uh, talk about it all that much. And yeah, it's all this fun of services, and we'll show it in a bit. It has rolling updates so that you can um, have a couple of Nginx running, then you say you want to update the image, and this um, update will be done in a rolling fashion, Ooh. so that um, you will tear down one service, update it, wait until this health check returns zero, and then you go on to it. Yeah, rolling update, scaling as well, and now demo. And the demo will follow after this couple, this two slides. So the new workflow is, in my opinion, that you start with a Docker file. So a developer curates this little Docker file, which is in the Nix and the application, the, the, the website within it, has its own uh, health check that he thinks is prop uh, proper to um, the, the container. And if he needs other components or other stacks around this, for instance, my, maybe a MySQL server for his uh, website, then he has a Docker Compose file that lives along it for development purposes. He starts this Docker Compose file, and then he can start developing on his um, actual container. If he's finished, then he will provide the Docker Compose file to um, the release engineers or to the pre-ops or whatever you call it, and or DevOps. And then um, everyone knows, okay, this is the stack I want to run. And um, they can then create, after the initial testing is done, they create a Docker application bundle out of it. And what this means, I just I, I said it already, that this Docker application bundle will address um, the content of the image. And it's basically, I said, a frozen stack. I think that's, I, I don't have a better term. But it's a frozen Docker Compose file. So after you created this Docker bundle, Docker application bundle, you can ship this as an artifact because it will provide um, the same experience no matter when you start, because it addresses the images with the content hash. Yeah, and now we come to the little demo. OK, so questions? I talk too much, maybe. OK, then maybe we take it at the end. No short questions? You're very elaborate. Can you Start now? I start. <laughs> so what I have done, and I will show this first. So all this, what I'm doing here is uh, on my little website. I have a blog post created today where I have all the steps that I'm now doing to for you guys to uh, to to redo. So what I first do, or what I already did, is I create a multi Docker uh, host environment, a multi Docker engine environment with a little Vagrant stack. So I have uh, three hosts. Well, hopefully, I still have three hosts, but yeah, here they are. And um, they are just simple Docker engines. So they run the latest version, of course. And they all are not uh, part of a swarm. They are, just, they are just normal Docker engines. So when I want to create a swarm cluster, I do swarm init. And then he will complain that I have to tell him which address to use. So I will do this. So now I have a 
little swarm cluster that can do. It's only one one node in it, but this will change. And um, I now address the second host. Join. And I will um, take the endpoint of the second host and we'll use this token Bam. and the IP. Sorry to be a pain. Could you move the important stuff with your terminal up a bit? Because no one can see it. I think. Could okay, you sure. <laughs> so I will use this. Maybe like this. So what I just did, I pointed the Docker client to the second host and joined him to the uh, to the to the swarm cluster, and I can make it a little bigger as well. So we have now two nodes, and then surprise, I will do this for the third host as well. And so, et voila, we have three hosts now. So this is our swarm cluster in uh, one minute. And um, yeah, maybe I first show this little dummy stack. So how you create a cluster or how you create a service is with create service. What a surprise. Then you give it a name, Nginx, uh, a port to expose. And then, well, let's say Nginx. And this will create a service. This service has one replica because I didn't specify more. And it is downloaded now. And once it's downloaded, it will start eventually. So it's PS. Yeah, here we go. Now it's preparing, so it's not running already. So a service, this is this, this command, um, has different tasks. A different task is just the, the working task that the Docker engine has to do to run a specific container on one of the engines. So a task corresponds basically to a container. And here we go, it's running now. And it's running on node swarm zero. You see it here. And if I do, I'm oh, not localhost, because I'm on the virtual machines. Um, 8080, it should give me an Nginx website. So, ooh, we have a service. So, Abemo service. And I can uh, create more replicas by replicas equals two for Nginx. And then um, he will do the same. Like downloading the image. So it's downloading the image again yeah. because it hit a different node. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's, it hits a different node, so now it's on Swamps 2. And um, when it's running, so now it's running. And if I now do curl, then the Docker, uh, the Swarm Kit part of the Docker engine will round robin me to a different container. Every time I hit the endpoint, it will give me a different container. That's not really good uh, seeable here because we get the same output because we run the same container, but um, I mean, I could, I mean, maybe you will leave me right away, but I can do user shared Nginx HTML index. Yeah, thank you, hello. And then we have hello, and next time we have the different container. And I can do this over and over, and it will constantly give me a round robin uh, container. And if I start five, then I will get five different IPs, uh, the different uh, services, right? Okay, so now questions again about Docker services. So this is a basic Docker service explanation. And the we saw it, or we saw it not. Uh, here in this case, we don't have a health check. But um, what the health check is supposed to do as well, but it's not in Docker 1.12, that if the, Docker, if the health check is not healthy, that you do not get this um, container in this load balancer. But now you still will get this faulty container in the load balancer. So this is something that they will fix in 1.3, at 13 they said. So um, if you, um, yeah, you should not rely on this load balancing thing, that's my point. Because if the container is not healthy, you still get the same. Uh, you still get this container in this uh, load balancing. 
Okay, so let's remove this service and get to the fun part. So this. So let's. Uh, so what I'm now going to do is I will start a console server, and for this, I create first I create a little overlay network. Uh, maybe I can do it like this, a little bit bigger. So this is what I talked about um, in the network part. So we have a couple of different uh, end or di different network plugins already. So the local one is just a local nutted network. And then we have an overlay network here, so the overlay driver, which uh, creates a network that is uh, true in the complete Docker Swarm cluster. And um, so now we have a network that I can use for my little um, service. And now the command is a little bit longer, but nevertheless, I will fire it up. So what I'm doing here, I can fire it up. I create one console service, I call it console blue, which publishes um, the port 8500, uh, 8500 on 8501. And um, I use my Alpine console uh, container. And this one will just start a service that um, waits for three other or two other console um, containers to connect to him. And the the problem that I'm solving here is that if you are within a service and you have two containers, like uh, the nginx container I showed before, and uh, which is which name is uh, nginx.0 and then a little hash, you cannot really um, know the IP address of this other task in your own service. So in console, if I start three nodes uh, and I want to join them somehow, then I have to do console join and then uh, reach the other one. But when I'm inside of the container, I do not know the IP address of this other host and I do not know the name of the other host because the name has a hash in, the, in, in it that I cannot predict. Um, what I can address is this name. I can address this console blue name, this is the service name itself, but when I do this within one container, then it will, um, yeah, it will form it, forward me to myself, which is not really helpful if you try to reach your buddies, right? So if I try to reach, reach him, then I will just be pointed to myself and then I cannot join him. So what I need is I need actually two services where I start the first service with one replica, which is then my, my seed, so to speak, for the second service. And the second service will try to connect to uh, console blue and will then reach console blue, and everyone is reaching console blue, so I have created a swarm cluster. And this is what we will see. A next. console cluster. A console, yeah, it's console data center, it's called, but let's call it console cluster. So now I do the same command, or a slightly different command, but it looks quite similar. So here I create console green. I use a different mode, so I do use the service mode global, which will start one, uh, instance one task on each swarm node, which is pretty neat because if you create a new swarm node in, within your swarm cluster, then this service will automatically uh, schedule on different on all the hosts or all the swarm nodes within your cluster. And here's apart from this published port, so he will use the actual uh, console UI port, but the rest is uh, the same. So I now start the service um, console green. And this service will reach out for um, console blue, and hence will, they will create a Docker uh, a, a, a console cluster. And so let's go to the IP address. So now we have, yeah, which one was the first one? I don't know. So one of these was the first one. So now we have a, a console cluster that comprises of four, four nodes. Three are from the just started console green network uh, <coughs> service, and the other one was the console blue one. And what I'm now doing, I remove the blue one because we don't need it anymore. And I will create the blue version with the same global mode. So now we have two nodes or two services with three uh, tasks each. And this will be reflected here. So now I have six nodes, right? So, so simple. So one node left and uh, three others 
um, were joining. So now I have a fully fledged console cluster as a service in Docker. And the cool part is, as I use these two names to uh, reach, reach them, I now can just tear down one and start it with new containers or scale them up or whatever because they are able to reach the other group. So I have now two groups and they try to reach both groups, but when they try to reach the group they are in, they, they won't get any connection, so uh, they have to use the different. This is a little workaround, uh, and hopefully they will change it by not using um, this weird names. So this is the name of one of the hosts. So you can, you can log into any of the containers, and then you can resolve this host name, but when you start a container, you cannot predict this host name. So if they only would use this name here, then I could get rid of my two services because I can predict that the first container and the second container and the third container are just increased numbers. So that would be the hopefully solution in the future. Anyway. Pardon? You can use that for that, but yeah. Right. I could. Okay, so this is Consul. Um, and now, I mean, console itself is a little boring, so what I did today, I created a little Elasticsearch container, and I use, I, I create now an Elasticsearch service uh, <coughs> similar to the, to the other commands. I will join the uh, console blue and the console green service again, because either as one of them should be up and running, and I will use the global mode. And this. Should be reflected here as well. Sometime. Oh, Twenty-six. Yeah, I have to download the image. Oh, it's most likely preparing. Yeah, preparing. So, take a zip. Questions. <laughs> Let's see. So the question was if it's going to make a cluster. So in case you're wondering, I was the one that asked the question. Yeah. Exactly. Let's say I hope so, and I'm quite confident that it, they will, but you never know. So now the image was downloaded, so preparing is a state when it's preparing the container, it's a little obvious. And starting is a state when the health shake is still false. So the first time, you, like a state machine, you start a container, the service, uh, the health check service, as uh, a health check state will be starting as long as the health check returns uh, non zero return code. And the first time the container returns uh, zero as a, as, a, as a return code, you get it running. So now my health check should be all right. And um, I can have a little peek into the Elasticsearch Docker file that I use. And here I provide the little health check. The health check is pretty simple, I guess. It's just doing a curl for the, um, uh, the, the endpoint, and then it checks the health status, and if it's green or yellow, um, then I, I proceed. Why green or yellow, you might ask, so maybe not, but uh, the problem is that Unlike uh, in, in uh, Kubernetes, you have two different tests you can run, two different checks. So the readiness check and the liveliness check. And uh, if you, as I do here, I ask for the cluster state. And if one node of the cluster goes down, then the cluster might go into the yellow state, even though the container I run the health check on has nothing to do with it. He's not, it's not his fault, right? So you. And they hopefully will change it a little bit or add another health check that you can provide two checks. So if you are not the problem, then you should not return a health check that is not, not okay. Because if you do this, then you propagate the problem and you have like an infinite, uh, you scale out the problem and um, you won't make any good in this. So there should be a check that, that provides information whether it's my fault and if it's not my fault, then I can live. Or if it's my fault, then I should die. So, and this problem, this since there is only one health check, you have to be careful which health check to choose because if you are not root of the problem, then you will tear down your whole Elasticsearch cluster, even though one node was uh, the fault. So that 
just a side note. Um, yeah. And it's a little bit, uh, maybe I can um, Okay, so let's see. The containers are now, should be nine, yeah? So we have three more nodes, and the nodes have also the Elasticsearch uh, node. And if I do a curl to the endpoint, then it should give me a nice output here. So we can see we have three nodes in the cluster, number of data nodes three, master nodes should be also three, and so we have a green cluster. Yay! So this is um, Elasticsearch running. And S curl, I mean, you like curl, I like curl as well, but um, you might want to use COP for uh, peeking into the, the Docker cl uh, the Elasticsearch cluster. So I now create a service named COP with a, a COP, um, <laughs> Elasticsearch COP is a service or is a website. It's fair to say it's a website. Some JavaScript code, I guess. It's fair to say. And it provides just a UI to um, deal with Elasticsearch a little bit nicer. And I know I'm not using the global mode anymore. I just use two replicas because I, I, I mean it's just a viewer for Elasticsearch, so I don't care if it's one or two uh, or three. Um, and I don't want to put a COP on all the nodes. So imagine I have 12 swarm nodes and I run COP everywhere. I mean, it's, that's no use for that. I just use two that if one goes down, then I still have another one. And um, hopefully, so COP is running. So if I do now go to the, to the endpoint, wasn't it 80? Here we go. And this is, yeah, this is COP. It shows you the cluster, so all the nodes in the cluster. And funny though that I, I use only one CPU and one gig of RAM and Elasticsearch doesn't like it so much. So the load of the virtual machines is pretty high actually. So I have now um, yeah, three nodes and three, three nodes here, no indices so far. And if I put some stupid stuff in the Elasticsearch like this, so create it, then I have one Twitter in this index in my uh, in my co in my Elastic search cluster. Yeah, that's basically the end of the story. Sorry, how do you, when you store the data? The data is stored within the containers. So what happens if you upgrade? If they, if they all get torn down, your data is gone. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, what I'm using here now is uh, just a local Docker volume. So if we inspect one of the nodes, one of the containers, sorry, we will see that I have a volume for somewhere. Where's the volume? We should see, let's say. Uh, use find, my colleague said, but I won't. <laughs> Damn it! Okay, I use find. Yeah, we see here. No, we see, don't see it here. We see it here that the the container uses the volume data and the volume logs, um, which are then outside of the of the copyright system. But you're totally right that if I lose the container, then the data is gone because these volumes are just bound to the container. I could do slash data and, and store this uh, data volume on a concrete, on a specific path, an absolute path on the host. So when I start a new container, it could reuse the same volume underneath. But I didn't because I have multiple, maybe multiple containers on. In this case, I don't have multiple containers. So yeah, I could use um, the data volume that is an absolute path on the host. And if I restart the container, then it will reuse the same data for you. But I didn't, so yeah, you're right. So if I remove the container, then uh, the data is lost. But I mean, I can lose, I can it's afford losing. Data. Yeah, I mean, I can afford losing this one tweet. So I, don't, I don't care much. Yeah, but right, so yeah. But this is just a, a little demo. I mean, don't use this in production. Um, I only have one core and one gigabyte. I don't think that's, that's really helping much. Speaking of production, do you actually use Docker one No. <laughs> I mean, it's 
it's still it has a lot of changes compared to the previous versions and I think it would be an adventure to use it in production. I mean this Docker services for instance this Docker application bundle that I talked about and I can show you how to create it so I'll sit down again. Yeah, I think I, I so for for the serious stuff I still use Docker 1.12 and 1.11 because and I use a normal swarm cluster for this. I mean serious, it's also not that serious, but for stuff that I would like to keep, I use Docker 1.11. And uh, Docker 1.12 is uh, just yeah, for, for now it's a, it's a playground and to explore how, how it involves. I mean, the, I said the Docker Compose file is pretty complete, so you can specify what you like to reserve in terms of CPU and RAM. This is not part of the Docker application bundle. Um, for instance, what's also not part is the amount of containers you want to run, so the mode and the replicas, also not part of the Docker application bundle, so that's clearly not intended to be used yet. This application bundle is not intended to be used yet. I think this uh, Docker services for some uh, experiments and for getting your feet a little bit wet, I think that it will emerge to be very, very nice, and it, it's, it is, I mean, uh, you can s spin up an Elasticsearch cluster and Docker service, um, and it's, it's going to be very nice, but also this load balancer problem that you will also get load balance to unhealthy containers, it's clearly not what you want to do, right? Or, yeah, so a little bit of quirks and they have to uh, flatten them out over the time, but they will, and uh, yeah. I even uh, encountered problems um, flying these are constraints in Yeah, and yeah, for me the same. They might end up just on the same note. Yeah, I have the same issue, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's I think it's, that's good to know that it was me. Maybe it's us. You're German, maybe it's Germans. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. So, yeah, it's, it's don't use this in production, but use it at home. <laughs> My advice. Yeah. Um, I think so. Under the hood, it uses IP tables. Maybe just a quick peek into how it's. And I'm not fully understand it myself, so don't ask me too much questions about it. But um, we can have a look. So here, 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 here. So this, as I said, my background box. And I, this is a part that I haven't tried out, but uh, I guess it should work. So I become root. I use IP tables, minus T nut, minus L. And we should see, here we go. We see IP tables, Docker ingress forwarding rules, and so on, which are, I guess, created when you create a service. And when you tear down the service, and this is, a, this is an IP address that is virtual, so that's uh, like a placeholder IP address, so no actual container has this IP address. It's just a placeholder IP address that all the containers share. So I did this Docker inspect here, so they have um, multiple IP addresses. This is a real IP address, and then they have a VIP address somehow. Uh, this one, I think. Yeah. So they have they have two IP addresses. So if you log in, say in here. IP. So this is the ingress IP address, which is the front-facing IP address, and this is the IP address of the actual IP address of the host, and this is, as you see, it's a slash 32, makes no sense. Um, this is the VIP address that is a placeholder for all Elasticsearch service uh, containers. But this, I, I mean, I'm, I'm totally out of my, my knowledge here. I haven't, I haven't fully understood it myself. But anyway, it's somehow they use weird IP tables magic that I don't understand. And, um, can, you, can you also have like a virtual IP address for virtual services? For example, like, say, I mean, in Kubernetes you can have, for example, a like Canary version and like the reflection version uh, track. Uh, is it the same principle there? I don't 
think so yet, but I think, I wouldn't say they steal from Kubernetes, but they're clearly, I mean, it's an inspiration, I think, and rightly so, because it uh, has nice features. Um, and I don't want to rant about Kubernetes, but what I dislike and what Docker solves here quite nicely is that you have the same environment and the same look and feel from developer's laptop to production or to testing and performance testing environment and then to production environment. So it will look the same. And as an ops guy, you can blame the developer and say, okay, your Docker Compose file didn't work. And you can, in my opinion, not do the same with Kubernetes because Kubernetes, you give, maybe you gave a Docker Compose file to your ops guys and they will come up with a, a description for Kubernetes and then you are, you are out of, Outside, I think, but this is my, my opinion. Yeah, we, we kind of played around with Docker also, and we kind of wanted something that is very similar in the development and production, but there's just so much missing. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would say in this one that obviously you can't use it yet. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's Docker Inc., right? They, they attack the biggest use case at the simplest use case first and then I'm not sure how they do it but they somehow wait for requests that are coming in and then then decide which to properly implement somehow so I come from the HPC environments for the HPC community they don't give a damn about the HPC community because it's just a niche so they go for the small the biggest part or the biggest chunk they believe it's the biggest biggest chunk so for them it's like the developer empower the developer but that's the phrase I use and um, yeah, it's not clearly not not fully complete in terms of all the other uh, contenders like Kubernetes and Mesos, and they have their use case and they have their. Um, I don't, I don't know. It's just a little bit frustrating. On like they make blog posts. Yeah, we're ready for production now. We have orchestration. Yeah, but maybe not for your production. <laughs> Someone else's production. Yeah, I mean, okay. <laughs> to, the, to the storage thing, you can use uh, Flocker. Yeah, then I use a very ugly Docker volume NFS share <laughs> plugin. That's what we also ended up with. <laughs> but which is which is a little bit stupid, I think, because I use the I use NFS servers on on all my hosts, and if one goes down and you eventually have the state on this host, then you are screwed anyway. So what I would like to use, I think, is something like CephFS as a backend or. Uh, maybe VGFS or there are a couple of backends out there and they said it's pretty simple to write this backend so I think there will be a lot more plugins for volumes coming up but this is I, I haven't much looked into so I'm not sure about volumes. Yeah? I have a question regarding the uh, uh, namespaces for that so you can you can provide user namespace and user namespace will say okay everyone who is in the container no matter which I, UID he has he will expose uh, or he will use uh, or he will use this UID that you provide so maybe you are like user one outside of the host uh, outside of the container and then you can say via user namespaces that no matter what file is written by no matter what user within the container it will appear as user one outside of the container so this was. So, so you could say that uh, like the, the range from the uh, uh, root is one. Like yeah, some, no. some users, some, some users on the container always end as uh, UID thousands on the. Yeah, but you can only say it globally. So you cannot specify user one inside of the container is user twenty outside, and user two inside is user twenty one outside. So that you cannot do. So you can only provide one user ID, and I think Google as well, but I'm not sure. Uh, for the container server. Yeah, does this solve the issue? This solves one issue. I mean, this solves this doesn't solve the issue if you have group multiple group IDs for a user and you want to have complicated ACLs for this data that you write or read. But the mm -hmm. issue so that you just described. Just a simple case. I have a user inside a container. It doesn't matter root or any user, and I would like to 
like to write uh, to my post as the as some local user which I can edit locally and the files will be changed from the mm -hmm. new container to the yeah, then you use user, user IDs and he will have the same rights as the user ID that you provided as a username, as a user namespace. But I, 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 I haven't used much security features, so I haven't used it extensively, so, but this is how I understand it. One more question. Okay. <coughs> what about orchestrating? Well, what do you mean orchestrating? Ah, auto scaling. Yeah, um, I think with global you can kind of auto scale. So when you add another swarm host, then you will scale your cluster. But what you might mean is like if you have a lot of load. Yeah, but if you have a lot of load on your service, you want to scale it out. That's you have to script around yourself. I think that's. But I guess. And yeah, this actually, well, the future I'm waiting for because it was just for. Well, I would say it would actually apply to many hosts like, uh, I don't know, Mac Trumps or whatever, where I have a peak load, you know, because advertisements and stuff. But just to scale up immediately, then that is what Doc was actually built for. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but I think this is the same goes for, for this as well, that if there's a NAND, they will implement it because they have the, they, they know the performance values of all containers and it should be easy to say, okay, if the load of the container is high and you only have so much containers or the average load is above yeah, something, then you scale it up. Yeah, it's somewhat implemented, right? So. I, I have the rule that I only stick with absolute docker. I, I mean, I, I don't want to get it to a vendor lock into others. Yeah. Which is <laughs> yeah, but I get only to docker vendor lock in. No, I don't know. Yeah, but I, I haven't used it because I stick with a vanilla Docker stack. Okay? And if you like this stuff, so I work for Gaikai, which is uh, the company behind PlayStation now. So this video game streaming. So basically, it's YouTube, but much nicer because we have controller feedback and we cannot cache anything. So it's like YouTube and Netflix are boring now. Now with Gaikai is a new feature. And if you like what I just talked about, I mean, we are looking for guys who want to work in Berlin, not yet, but we might look for them. So if you want to work with us, with me, then uh, feel free to grab a card. And there are also other people in the office. Yeah, there are also other people in the office. Yeah, that's right. Like, but it's, yeah, it's others. As well. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. So feel free to grab a card and ping me, and then maybe we have an open, or we have, I think I, ah. We have some open positions, but this is not with Docker, so it's boring. So you should wait for the one with Docker. And if you want to to previously know before we put it there, then you can grab my card. Okay, so thanks. That's it.